um, the uh, Policy and Scrutiny Committee for Health and Social Care, Monday the 6th of March, 2023. Um, any apologies? Yes, Chairman, we've got apologies from Councillor David Adams and we've got uh, Councillor Clara Richardson standing in for him. Um, we're expecting uh, Councillor Nick Stewart, but he's not uh, appeared as yet. OK. Um, and, and from Michaela as well. So, confirm the minutes. Can we have a proposal for the minutes? Yeah, and a second. Of Declarations of interest. Um, any anybody got any interest they wish to declare? If you think of it at the time, then just just let it be known. <clears throat> public questions. No public questions. No. Okay. Um, outcomes and recommendations. So. Some time ago, we were concerned. Um, uh, the absence of patient of activity from patient participation groups, and I'm not sure whether they've reformed. Um, certainly, in some surgeries, they that they haven't. Um, and if um, if there's some sort of link, most areas now have got a place plan or are going to have a place plan so ride is quite mature newport is quite mature cows is getting off the ground and the bay is now developing a place plan so it might be a good opportunity to link ppgs but um michelle are you, are you able to give us an update on the ppgs Can you hear me all right? Um, so prior to the pandemic, we had um, actually a very vibrant uh, patient participation groups and each surgery had one. Um, I can obviously talk from experience of my patient participation group and um, they have were and have been absolutely fantastic. Um, and we did um, some great work together with them. They were actually um, involved in helping shape our practice to be uh, age friendly. And um, somewhere on the uh, internet, there is a um, video which we made with um, Age UK um, showing how we designed that. And um, it is a really, really good video if anybody wants to, to see it. Um, however, during the pandemic, we obviously had to stand down patient participation groups, um, PPGs for short. And um, I know some practices used a more virtual approach because actually you could um, engage with younger members. Uh, my own uh, PPG was uh, always face to face um, and that suited a more um, older population. Um, and then since and during the pandemic, we had to stand them down, obviously, for obvious reasons. And then practices have been um, reinstating them um, as as the pandemic has ceased. Um, we've obviously also had quite a difficult winter with other viral infections. Um, there's also something about do we actually want to do patient participation groups across PCNs? So, um, you know, have a have one for the northeast, have one for the south and have one for Western Central. And that might be another way of going forward. So, so it, they're, they're definitely um, considered to be really important, um, absolutely valuable, um, but also maybe we may change how we engage with people. Um, and obviously there's that slight tension between virtual works really well for some cohorts and face-to-face -face works with others and how, how do you try to do both. Um, but yes, they're, they're certainly um, being reintroduced um, and obviously they were only stood down because of the pandemic. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Michelle. Um, we did have a... Did anybody want to say anything? Sorry. Got Simon, Bryant, Chairman. So, Simon. 
Good evening, Chair. Apologies, I, I'm online. Uh, it's just it's relating to the same item, but kind of slightly different from what Michelle was saying around the health and wellbeing boards, looking at linking the place plans, the regeneration plans with some of the work that Michelle's talking to really bring that health and regeneration agenda together. So that's another item that's moving forward by the health and wellbeing board. Thank you very much, Simon. Um, we, Michael. I think it's it's important part of that, just to add to what Simon said, you now have a sort of resilience officer team or resilience worker, not sure of the things, that is established through Isle of Wight Community Action uh, and uh, has a overall coordinator and then has resilience workers, I think in six locations, I think six workers within that team. And they are now working with uh, a team through regeneration of a, a, a team that is also, I think, Ride is with Newport and there's Sandown Bay. So there is there is a network uh, of sort of post-COVID um, looking at, at well-being and, and resilience. And I think that that is starting to sort of feed in um, of that. Uh, it is feeding very effectively into into right, and I know uh, we're within that. Thank you, thank you, Michael. Uh, Claire, I'm not sure if this comes under risk, but it's something that's come from. It says from previous meetings, but there is something I just wanted to get the heads up from that happened for council. Um, is that okay if I put this here? Um, so at full council, we voted on the budget. Um, many of us who voted against the Alliance budget because of our feelings about the Stroke Association um, have had a thank you letter from the Stroke Association and looking forward to us is discussing it this evening. Um, I think it was Councillor Lilly that said at that meeting that will we be discussing it. I think we need to make it very clear that once that budget was voted on, that money for the Stroke Association was no longer in the budget as voted for. So we've all, I think there's been a very confusing message being put to the Stroke Association on what really could be done for them. That vote was done at that meeting. I think we need to clarify that. Thank you, Claire. Having spoken with the Stroke Association and seeing their extensive uh, national network dedicated to supporting people who've had strokes, um, I've no doubt of the value of their service. Um, yet fully understand the unpalatable situation that we as a council uh, find ourselves in, having to make choices and funding that we don't otherwise wish to make. And I've had assurance from the Director of Adult Social Care that that uh, people that uh, there is there is cover um, from uh, other sources. But the decision to cease funding of the Stroke Association under contract, the commissioning of the contract in June this year, um, is one of regret, I think. And finding some source or sources that could um, perhaps extend their service to the end of the financial year would allow them breathing space to um, to consider other options, and I think the cost of doing that is somewhere around fifty thousand, fifty, fifty-five thousand. But it's just a point that I think um, we should make at scrutiny that you know, whilst we understand the financial pressures that um, that uh, the Stroke Association, who have a small presence on the island and carry out some valued work. Um, if somebody is prepared to put their hand in their pocket, then it's not that much in the great scheme of things. Thank you. I just I think that there was a very confused message where it said that it was going to be discussed. I think they felt the feeling that the money could be put back in the budget, and I think we need to make it very clear that that, that was voted on at full council. Um, so, yeah, I just think we, it, they, a confused message was given out last Wednesday to the Stroke Association. We need to clarify that. Thanks for raising the point, uh, Joe. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Two two points. If I could just follow on from the, the stroke money that we've been talking about. I think, you know, the council, is, as Councillor Mosdell said, have taken the money out of the budget going forward. But does that mean there's an acceptance on the Isle of Wight that that service 
or, or a service under that type of contract is no longer required because it, if, if the council aren't going to fund it and no one else is willing to pick it up, that is a loss. It's a reduction of uh, professional headcount to support those recovering from stroke. And it's a reduction of overall service across the island. And for elected members on, on this side of the, of the chamber, uh, our residents care little about who's funding a service. If a service is needed and it's vital, they want to see it continue. And I don't think we do ourselves a service as a council to simply say it shouldn't be us, even if there is good reason why it shouldn't be for us. If the conversations to encourage others to provide that service or provide funding to that service or a similar service are not being had. Um, my second point is completely unrelated. And it's about dentistry. I don't know whether maybe if the stroke's still being talked about, we'll, I'll, I'll we'll pick that. Come on to dentistry in a minute. Uh, so, Carl, did you have your hand up? Yes. Th uh, thank you for clar clarifying that, um, Councillor Mosdell. You, you raise a good point. I think my officers have been very clear about uh, with the Stroke Association about what we can and can't do. And certainly, Councillor Robinson, you, you're right. This is not a service that we wanted to end. It's it's been a service that with great regret that we've had to, you know, look at the, the funding in other areas um, of, and, and target that funding of most need. I'm not saying that they aren't needy because there's clearly a need for the service. I think the thing is, is, is that we would hope that we can try and find and support them to find, as well as us, um, a, a funding stream that can can carry that forward. Um, we, it's a deep regret that 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 we've had to make the decisions that we've made. But I can say that, that I believe that my office has been very clear with the stroke association about what it is that we can and can't do. And I think if 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 you would allow, um, my uh, uh, Laura, sorry, I don't know what's happening with me today. To um to comment, I'd be uh, grateful. Thank you, Chair. And just to provide um some confirmation as to the specific question asked, prior to taking the decision and moving the pro proposal forward, I'm grateful to colleagues at the Integrated Care Board and also at the Isle of Wight NHS Trust who were able to confirm to us that the stroke pathway provision on the island does meet all national indicators and provide in full for the needs of people who experience stroke and their family locally. Um, the ICB have, through their commissioner, undertaken a deep dive and been able to confirm that um, all of the prevention as well as stroke survival performance criteria are in place and are delivered by the NHS Trust in full. That includes a six-month, a 12-month and then an annual um, link and support for people and their families. So we remain satisfied that the services that stroke survivors need on the island are being provided through the ICB's contract with the NHS Trust. Whilst I'm eternally grateful to the Stroke Association for the additional services they provided on island, um, it remains open to them to continue to do so. They are a national charity and many of the resources that they utilise to support local people continue to be provided through their website and are fully accessible. We also have the benefit of an outstanding Carers Association here on the island and Carers Isle of Wight already receive referrals from the Stroke Association directly to support carers of people who survive stroke. They remain in place to be able to do that. So we're satisfied that the support for people with stroke, whilst different, is in place here on the island. Michael. I think the two points I wanted to make. Well, one was, I think, uh, obviously, there was issues possibly of, of communication of the of the uh, the fact that it came into the public. There was a lot of letters that went round and and signed. And I suppose, well, I think one of the points is sort of lessons learned really is that because that actually then causes a lot of distress to people. And I think we need to to look at how that is that if there's similar things in the future, how are they managed, right? Uh, and, and, and can we sort of manage them better so that you don't have this this kind of bun fight that's sort of created and and the lobbying and 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 the fight. Which in one way I can 
probably understand at a local organisation level, but for a national organisation to get involved in, in that. So I think we do need to, you know, decisions are being made, uh, quite rightly, as, as uh, Councillor Modso has said, but we do need to actually look, we do... Huh? No, I'm just saying a decision was made. I didn't say you had, you pointed out a decision had been made. And I think the, 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 the key is how can we learn from that? Because it did cause a whole lot of unnecessary uh, distress. And I, I did at the full council, you know, raise that um, at, at the particular time. My last particular point is talking about causing distress and confusion. If you go anywhere around, particularly on a Saturday at weekend, um, the island, you do come across people in green with green buckets collecting money for stroke support. I have no idea who they are, but I stood by a recent uh, a lady who was very distressed because someone had had a stroke in her family, thanked them this particular lady and put thirty pounds in um, with it because he actually believed this was going to help people directly on the island. Uh, these are not the National Association of Stroke uh, at, at all. Uh, they seem to be bona fide and they have the things, but um, can can we find out about this? Because definitely in my area, ride people think they're helping the Stroke Association by actually um, putting that forward. They, they are regularly around. You will see them regularly around. We'll, we'll, um, we'll get Amanda Gregory to look at that. Michael, thanks for raising that. Uh, Laura. Uh, through you, Councillor Nicholson. Um, there is a stroke club on the Isle of Wight who are a registered charity who operate at a local level. I would hate for us to be seen to be doubting the validity of an organisation undertaking local fundraising. It could well be linked to that organisation. Um, I think Amanda Gregory and her team are probably the best team to be looking into it. It wouldn't be something that I'd have any information on. Hey. to the public they think they're supporting that you know stroke support and i just think if I think if, they, if there is a stroke club then obviously there are other stroke organizations that are actually supporting it'd be good for us to know that i think you got the point well made uh, i think we need to be really careful because we do have the press reporting on this and i completely agree with laura gordian that actually we could cause a huge amount of confusion here and severe damage. So if we're going to find out um, that this group are bona fide, because I've seen them and I'm sure they are bona fide completely, but we've now put it in a public domain with the media here. So we need as a matter of urgency before any damage is done by Councillor Lilly to those who would be goodwill. It's, it's the, I totally object. I totally object to that. Yeah, Absolutely let's... object that. You're asking for them to be investigated to I'm check not... that, that they're no, causing I wasn't. confusion. Let, I what I was making the point, Councillor Mod, still. I am still, here. Let's leave, I'm leave not far away, and you don't need to raise your voice to me. I'm very concerned that it could cause confusion. And Councillor, Michael, you need I'll to speak on. through the chair. Sorry, as a chair, you know, you know. You, can you remind Councillor Critchley? The point, the point's been the made, chair. and I think I think we've taken it in the spirit. And yeah, okay. Um, can I make it clear? that all I want to see is the residents of the island know where the support is coming from. If there's a variety of organisation, can we right. clarify that? And I'm sure the media, sure Louise, would want to actually make sure that that is the case. OK, of, of, of that. Thank, thank you. Point's been made, thank you. Joe, you were going to make a comment on dentistry. Yeah, uh, I, if we're still on item five, it's on the um, the uh, progress, action, and outcomes. Dentistry on the Isle of Wight. Um, I see that uh, a letter was written to the MP on behalf of the committee in December, um, requesting him to ask the Secretary of State 
to make changes to the leadership of those responsible to national level for dentistry. Do we know what whether he's responded, what the MP's position is in relation to that? Chairman, the, the MP has indicated that he is taking it up with the Secretary of State. OK, so that was a, a, a positive response. Yeah, OK. Darren, did you? Thank you. I, I just wanted to, uh, through you, Chairman, just talk about something very, very briefly that we started to think through uh, as appointed officers from a leadership perspective on how we think and start to plan and make decisions collectively. So we've all got complete sight and visibility of those things that we are concerned about and the impact if those things change as we go forward. So, so it's a bit of good news for the future rather than good news for today. Um, but that's probably something that we should look forward to. That's across all parts of the organ organisations uh, within the health and care partnership. So it, it's it's good news that we can start to think about some of the things that each of us do separately and the impact on others before we make those decisions. And I think it's a really important principle. OK, thank you. So we'll move on to um, item six now, which is winter pressures, which I guess is you again, Darren. I do hope not. I think Laura's going to kick off to start with, and then we're all going to participate, contribute. That's We're right, going Laura. to support Laura. Um, thank you, Chairman. We had hoped that this was Michaela's agenda item, but unfortunately she isn't with us, so I offered to step in in terms of where we are. Um, winter, as we know, as a system, tends to cause us significant challenges. Um, it feels as though we're in winter 365 days of the year at the moment, and that's both a blessing and a curse. Um, in terms of the blessing, what it means is that our teams are used to working at significant pace and with great attention to detail to manage unprecedented demand throughout the year. In terms of the curse, we never have sufficient money available from central government to enable us to be innovative and to plan long-term sustainable solutions for our local population and for local people. The winter planning for 22-23 um, started about this time last year. And what we didn't know at that time was the substantial increase in demand that all of our services would see. That demand has had a knock on effect for each and every part of our system. And we've had to manage that dynamically with one off funding that's been made available to support us in terms of accessing increased levels of support for local people. Our key challenges for winter just gone, um, although today it feels like it's just here again, have been around workforce and around capacity. That continues to be the case. The challenges in securing and retaining on-island workforce right across the health and social care system are some of our biggest challenges we face as, uh, as a county. That workforce links directly to the capacity that can be made available across all of our services, be that the acute trust, our community division, social work in adult social care, approved mental health practitioners, care workers out in the community, doctors in GP surgeries, I could go on. The deficit in terms of workforce is so significant, the capacity and our ability to meet need at the level that need is required is often challenged. Through robust winter planning, what we managed to do this year was utilise the resources we had to the best of our advantage. What that meant was doing things differently. I've heard many people tell me that getting a GP appointment is impossible, that they've not seen their GP for a long time, that meeting with a social worker is impossible, that they've not seen their social worker for a long time, that when they've been to the emergency department, the delays they've experienced have been significant. It's largely linked to an inability to access the right support in the right way. And a lot of education has been necessary this winter to divert people to the right places to meet their needs in a more timely way. We've seen the continued use of e-consults through our doctors, of other practitioners. You might not see your doctor in your GP surgery, but you could be seeing somebody who's able to solve your problem more quickly and more effectively. I mean, no disrespect to our GPs, but they're not physiotherapists. And they've got direct access to physiotherapists within a GP surgery, which saves you two appointments by having just the one. 
in terms of social work, you may not have had a social worker out to undertake your review. But what we've done is link in with you, with your family member, and with the person who provides your care, who are far closer to you in your everyday life, to advise us as to what the best scenario for your care and support looks like. Through looking at winter through a different lens, by looking at the resources we've got available and our ability to do things differently, we've managed to come through this winter. Um, we've managed to come through this winter. I feel like that deserves a full stop. Um, but in a way that perhaps we hadn't anticipated we would at the beginning of the year. We've utilised funding to put in place a number of winter schemes. We've seen bluebells come online in terms of step down provision, additional home care teams. We have um, a care first bridging service for people coming out of hospital. And a lot of our efforts have been focused on that hospital discharge piece to ensure that the valuable resource that is St Mary's Hospital remains accessible to everyone who needs it. We continue with some of those winter schemes, but now what's absolutely key for us is evaluating the impact that they've had for local people. You can continue to throw money at a problem, but if you're throwing money at a problem that doesn't exist, or a problem that has little impact um, in terms of a solution for our community, it's not money being well spent. Across the local authority, the Trust and the ICB, we're currently working with a small team of specialist officers to really take a deep dive into all of those schemes to decide whether they've had the level of impact that we need for the investment that we've made and whether that return on investment has been advantageous for us as a system. That will help to shape our winter preparations for next year or for this year, the 2023-24 winter, and also enable us to make some informed decisions around our business as usual, what we need to do to make our own system more sustainable locally. Um, I'd invite Michelle and Darren to make any comments that they have above and beyond that really brief summary for you. Just wanted to say thank you to Laura because I thought that was um, a really um, excellent summary. Um, I would just like to emphasise the working together that we've done over this winter. Um, we've really had to do that, um, limited resources and with a shared uh, shared burden of, of, of what we had to uh, deal with this winter um, has really um, increased and improved our, our integrated working together. Um, I would just like to say that um, it, it's been really difficult and really challenging. Um, we've had a lot of viral infection. Uh, we've had a lot of COVID. We've had a lot of flu. But actually, without what we've put in place, it would have been a very much more difficult winter to, to deal with. So, so it's, it's a big thank you to people that have worked together and a massive thank you to our teams on the front line that have really um, gone always beyond beyond the mile every day um, trying to uh, support people. So thank you. Thank you uh, again to you, Chair. Uh, Laura, there's not much to add uh, in terms of um, what I wanted to say, but really just perhaps just a couple of points just to emphasise. The sum of the parts is definitely bigger than the sum of the whole rather than big, definitely bigger than the parts. And it's the common theme that's coming out of the, this particular meeting this evening. If we work together, we've got a far greater chance of resolving some of the challenges and issues that we face. And I think that's a really positive thing. We've learned that through this winter and what I've described earlier on about how we plan for the future. I think it has to be the, the overriding and, and guiding principle. There have been a number of pressure points through this winter. You know, we as an organisation were in critical incident for a very long time, um, but we've received full support from all partners on the island throughout that whole period. Um, and we were confident that the risks that that posed were understood and they were mitigated through um, what we were doing all day, every day, sometimes three or four or five times a day. So we worked together really well. I think our challenge is going to be, as Laura quite rightly said, that winter is no longer a three, four month period of time throughout a 12 month uh, duration. It's here now and the demand is different and where we see funding reduce that non-recurrent funding that Laura talked about where we see that funding reduced that's going to be a critical testing point for how we deliver safe and effective services as we go forward together I know Councillor Love has talked eloquently about this in previous conversations and previous meetings so it's going to be absolutely fundamental for us to understand exactly what we can continue with and what we can't 
And I think that needs to come back to a future uh, scrutiny uh, session, I would suggest, once the evaluation that Laura's talked about has been completed. Claire. Don't worry, I'm only a councillor for another 787 sleeps, not that I'm counting. Um, so you'll get rid of me eventually. Um, so this really frustrates me, winter pressure, and it's more of sort of a question for the healthcare professionals, really. Um, what happens in a heat wave? Isn't a heat wave just as dangerous if you are an elderly person as a cold winter's day? So we gear ourselves up for winter, but nobody ever talks about, and I'd like to know how dangerous it is and why don't we talk about what happens? Because, you know, last summer we had a drought, it was boiling hot. Um, what are, what are we geared up to deal with that sort of pressure? Um, I can answer a little bit of that, um, Councillor Mosdell. Um, so actually, instead of just warm spaces, um, last summer we had cool spaces. Um, so we introduced um, areas of, of coolness for, for um, people that were um, suffering with the heat. Um, we are aware that, that heat is very detrimental to people and there is um, often heat warnings. Um, we then, uh, a week or two before uh, the heat wave comes, um, issue warnings out to um, our patients. Nurses are really good at this um, across the island uh, to support people. We give them uh, support and information on how to remain cool. Um, we offer practical advice as well. But it was, um, I do believe that the cool spaces were at the um, aspiring ride. I might not be absolutely correct about that, but um, we, we did do uh, cool spaces because it was a terribly hot summer. So it is um, quite detrimental. I don't know the percentages, but um, lots of people do die during heat waves as much as they do during uh, uh, cool, uh, very cold winters. Um, but yes, we do prepare for that as well. So Simon? Yeah, thank you, Councillor Mosdell and, um, and Michelle. Really helpful to hear. Uh, so what we do know is that in winter we have excess winter deaths because there is more illness, respiratory illness, uh, and then other things like you know, the cold weather impacts on people falling. So we know that there is much more uh, illness in the winter. But uh, Councillor Mosdell, you're right. Uh, the heat wave does cause uh, significant pressure, and that's why we have emergency plans and putting uh, warnings out to various people to support them during the time they may be more at risk from illness. Thank you. Just uh, again through your chair, just to provide the committee with some uh, reassurance, uh, we have a nationally mandated annual operating plan, which covers the whole of the year. We have a particular focus, again, a nationally mandated requirement to produce a winter plan. That's why the focus is on winter. Um, but we also have a heatwave plan uh, within the organisation across the island that we roll out on a regular basis as well when the temperatures do reach those points. Thanks for that. Good point. Uh, Michael, did you want to say? I just wanted to actually say that I think one of the things that came from through COVID was better communication with all the agencies and particularly, you know, to, um, heavy involvement of the voluntary sector. Uh, and now we have Particularly, I think a large a number of larger of the town and parish councils that are actually now more involved in health and social care, have community development workers and and so on. So actually, I, I I think can we look at the 365 days of, of of the year and actually look how we improve uh, and well build on the improvements of of getting. Um, the help we, we we have a you know through this winter and through covid we have support networks and we have warm spaces we have much better uh, information going out to people uh, i think the information that is that is now going out is whatever your issue there is someone to probably help you it's a bit like the aa now isn't it it's sort of uh, within that so actually it's it's let's build on Instead of just you know saying the winter or the, the summer pressures, how, how do we actually make sure that every resident on the island that is going through um, difficulties um, actually you know um, benefits from that real engagement? I mean, perhaps go back to the place planning and the and the, and the side within that, but definitely place planning has had an effect on that improvement. So, D Darren and Leslie. 
Thank you. Uh, just very briefly, picking up on Councillor Lillie's point there, I think the reason that winter is so exaggerated nationally is that's when funding usually is associated, uh, that's when it's available, rightly or wrongly. That's the, that's the environment that we're operating in. So I think the real benefit for us, to pick up on your point there, uh, Councillor Lillie, is how we plan together to be able to roll new or changes or extensions or additions to services out when that funding is available. So we have to be ready. If the funding comes in the summer, let's roll it out in the summer. If the funding comes in the winter, let's roll it out in the winter. But the, the real crucial thing, I think, is for us to be ready to provide those services when the funding arrives, as opposed to think, goodness, we've only got a few weeks to respond. How do we do something really quickly and put something in place and then worry about evaluating something? We need to build it into a 365 day way of working rather than just that winter period. But I, that's just building on your point, really. And, and just to further build on your point, um, uh, one of the ways that we're uh, developing those plans is through uh, the Isle of Wight system community transformation program. Um, so um, Michelle, um, Laura and I are very actively involved. We've got colleagues across the voluntary sector, um, independent sector as well. We've got a really vibrant, uh, really well engaged group of people who are coming together every three months. Uh, to reflect on the work that they've done in the past three months and agree a plan for the next three months. So it's ongoing through the year um, with a real focus on how do we support people better in their communities close to home um, across a whole range of conditions. And that's been a really important part of the winter plan, but it's an ongoing plan as well. Um, and next week, I'm really pleased to say the system mental health transformation programme will um, be launched as well with a, a similar system wide view of how we support people uh, in the community with mental health problems. Thanks for that reassurance. Yeah. Uh, just to add on that, I think that the, the work that's been done by public health and with yourself on mental health in engaging grassroots groups through the I think nearly about 40 projects which have been funded through the small grant fund came from the public fund has actually really seen that effect now now that that we've seen that through health watch haven't we um which takes us on now to recruitment and retention in health and social care so i believe that's laura again it is. You'll be bored of me by the end of today's meeting, and I apologise. Um, I am very fortunate in having been voluntold to be the lead of the system-wide workforce board. Um, I say that in jest, but in actual fact, it's probably one of the most important tasks I've ever been given. Um, I've spoken to you before about the recruitment and retention challenges we as a health and social care system have. And the Health and Social Care System Workforce Board is tasked with solving them. It sounds even bigger when I put it like that. Um, it's a group that was developed following a workshop which took place in May of last year, where representatives from far and wide came together. And you do have a, a set of slides in your pack. I don't propose to take you through them, but I'm happy to answer any questions. I'm just going to give you some highlights. Um, as part of that session, we did a deep dive into the challenges that each part of our sector was experiencing, some of the quick wins that were available, but more importantly, how we as a system wanted to move forward to try and collectively resolve the challenges that we were seeing. Those challenges were plentiful, the solution slightly more scarce, but by coming together, we ended up being able to provide a focus on recruitment and retention in a way that we hadn't done so before. It became very apparent that the challenges one part of our sector faced were the same as challenges faced by another part of our sector, but equally apparent that whenever we undertook a recruitment exercise in one area, invariably staff from another migrated to those vacant posts. So in effect, we were robbing Peter to pay Paul and causing challenges more widely than, than any of us were cited on. We noted a number of key dependencies from housing to transport to schools and their performance, funding obviously, but also changes in public perception around health and social care. We saw 
a force get behind our NHS colleagues and social care colleagues during the pandemic. Um, I'm always told by the people I work more closely with in social care how distressing it was for them that social care was only picked up some eight to 12 weeks after people recognised the efforts of the NHS equally of value, but really lacking equity in terms of how they're viewed as a workforce are our social care workers. Raising their profile, helping our colleagues and local residents to understand that the social care workforce is a professional workforce who really add value to our local community has become part of what's driving our workforce uh, recruitment and retention board. We know that as a local authority area, we're a net exporter of young people and we need to encourage those young people to return to the island to take up these professional health and social care roles. Key to the people who engaged in that workshop was a need to learn from our past and not be bound by it. Um, we had many, do you remember when or oh, when that happened or oh yeah, but um, not being bound by those challenges is really important as we move forward. Our workforce will continue to be an issue unless we act and we need to ensure that we've got a clear system workforce strategy with a single accountable group reporting to our local delivery system. The ethos of our workforce board is about owning it, leading it and delivering it. And to that end, now the workforce is together and established, um, there are some key work streams that they're looking at in order to make sure that we're having some improvement. Those four work streams are around a stock take. Where are our big gaps? What are our big pressures? What do we know has historically been a challenging area for us as a system to recruit to health and social care roles? And then developing a strategy to help us take forward the filling of those gaps and solving those problems. Recruitment and onboarding, what can we do collectively? What do we need to do separately? But how can we really make sure we're not treading on each other's toes in that space. It's a bit of an own goal if we're pinching each other's staff all of the time and we need to make sure that not only are we cited on that, we do what we can to avoid those situations developing. We need to promote the island as an inspiring place to live and to work. We all choose to live or work here. There's a reason for that and that's not necessarily very clear to people when they're looking at our job adverts when they live on the, the other island or on the mainland. And we need to look at what we do to develop our workforce. It's only by investing in our workforce that we're going to be able to retain them. The leads for those for those work streams come from across the system uh, with engagement from public health colleagues, from children's services, from our partners at the Trust and at the ICB. Um, there are task and finish groups set up over each of those areas and each of those areas has a formal work programme that they're now working towards with key indicators of their performance coming back to the workforce board every time it meets. Escalations available for challenges up through the Health and Care Partnership Board proving really effective and we're starting to see some small shifts which are bringing about huge dividends. We've got an apprentice programme that's just started, which will see 22 um, level three college leavers moving into two year fixed term employment with the local authority as frontline workers in social care. For the first year, they'll be supported by buddies to help them understand that this is a job, but that they also have a career should they choose to make a career in the sector. And in the second year, they'll work on rotation, a very health term, I apologise, to dip in and out of different parts of our system, spending time with Mountbatten, spending time in the community unit, spending time out in our independent sector providers and with our occupational therapy service provider, so that they really are a skilled workforce at the end of their two years. It's a rolling programme, so every year we'll have 20 more of those people coming on board to be able to help them adjust to working in the health and care sector. Aligned to that, we'll shortly be la launching our Be The Difference campaign, which is a single website, an area where all of our social care vacancies initially can be advertised, regardless of who the employer is. That's going to help us to drag up the um, profile of these jobs to make sure that people know where they can go rather than having to rummage around through lots of different providers. Applying for jobs is soul destroying sometimes. You end up having to complete application form after application form. Many places don't accept your CV anymore. The Be The Difference website enables somebody to upload their information once. 
so that that information can then be shared on multiple applications, making it easier for people to secure work and safer for employers in terms of making sure that the key criteria that's so essential to them as part of their CQC frameworks are able to be there. Our plan is within 18 months, two years to open that Be The Difference website up to encourage our health partners to also utilise it for recruitment and retention. But at the moment, we need to start small and help that to grow. And that's very much the space we're in. We have a very active learning and development collaborative on Ireland who are currently in the process of looking at all of the different learning for health and social care workers right across the island with a view to avoiding duplication, to making sure the training we're providing is the best it possibly can be and as cost effective as it possibly can be for all providers. And it's the first time we've looked at learning and development opportunities in that way. I'm really encouraged because it gives learners the opportunity to come together with people who work within the same sector, but perhaps undertake different roles to share learning, to share experiences and to learn from others. What we know of our sector is it's full of passionate and driven people. These are employees, these are workers who, without a shadow of a doubt, go to work to make a difference and give 110 percent every single day of the week. If we can recognise that by supporting them and helping them to build peer support, it will go some way to helping retain that really valuable workforce here on the island in the future. There's lots of work still for us to do as a workforce board. It's still very young, having only had its first three meetings, but I am encouraged by the steps that we're taking. I'm encouraged by the level of engagement and also by some of the innovation that's coming out of that workforce board. Um, I hope that I'll be able to return to you next year with a really long list of all the amazing things that have already been achieved. And I'm encouraged that we're well on the way towards being able to compile that list. Thank you, Laura. Claire. Sorry. And Rodney. Um, so brilliant. And it's nice to see things are moving forward. But over the last four years, I've seen lots of workshops where we've discussed this tricky subject of workforce. Um, and it does worry me that we've had lots of senior managers on a huge amount of money coming up with the list that I've seen quite a few times before. Yes, it sounds good to be uploading CVs and stuff like that, but it does, you know, that's another whole afternoon when people on a vast amount of money have had the conversations that they've had repeatedly over at least three workshops that I sat in over the last four years. Um, so I've highlighted one of the things that I'd like an answer to. Pay parity will be essential to any changes in the recruitment and retention challenges, as will pay reflected of professional roles. So the tricky question is, if you had an independent nursing home and you had you were got the hospital um, and you were a nurse, where are you going to work? Are you going to go and work in the nursing home or are you going to go and work at the hospital, which will probably be paying you for the same grade and the same experience, more money with a pension and a better pay package. And until we actually get the answers of on this island for the roles that you do, you get paid the right money for doing the right roles. Um, people talk, if we're in an economic you know, crisis. People need to know that they're going to get the right money for their jobs. And, and at the moment, we've got real gaps in the system that nobody says, OK, let's get some money over to the independent sector so they can have the right nurses to get the people out of the beds in the hospital. And it all does come down to that bottom line of that's a real platitude to me. You know, when you read it, pay parity will be essential to any changes. There isn't anything that says, actually, we've all looked at our pay scales. We've all looked how we're going to help everybody to pay the same level of pay. So everybody across the system can pay the right pay for the right job. And until I personally think we get those actual nitty gritty answers, we will all continue to have these conversations. You know, it's like the ICB is great and you'll have great achievement, but actually you've all got statutory roles and everybody gets afraid of taking that risk of giving a bit of your power to the other sector to actually make sure that you really are jointly working. So have you actually had that discussion how we're going to move the money about to make sure there is real pay parity or was it a load of post-it notes that you all had a brain drop on and you all stuck it on a big board wrote on a whiteboard and then came up with this list that I've seen quite often before 
I, I very much like that Councillor Mosdell apologised before she asked and afterwards, but no apology is necessary. I absolutely share your frustration, as I know do Michelle and Darren. We've all been round this merry-go-round so many times and we've seen no progress. There are two key differences now. The first is rather than us all doing this in bits and pieces at hundreds of different boards and multiple different workshops, there is only one game in town when we're talking about workforce and we're being very careful to protect that and to maintain it. If it's not happening in that room, it's not happening because it's the only way we can retain control and start driving things forward as a system. In terms of pay parity, it's going to be one of the toughest things to fix. I'm a realist. There are multiple different frameworks governing the way in which people are paid, multiple different organisational rules. We're looking at two key things in this space that hopefully will start to make a difference. The first is a generic worker profile. So a terms and conditions set that can be applied to people of equal work roles, regardless of the organisations they work in. It's been trialled in other places and we'd be foolish not to learn from their um, I was going to say mistakes, but successes as well as mistakes. And that's a piece of work being undertaken through that recruitment retention pathway. Sorry, can I just ask, Laura, that covers the independent nursing homes as well, does it? Thank you. Uh, it covers many different things and we'll be looking at having a suite of profiles. Uh, initially, we're looking at healthcare assistants and support workers. That's our biggest part of our workforce. We'll then move on to looking at nursing staff, which will include the independent sector nursing homes, although there aren't many of them. The pressures there are significant. Our colleagues at the Trust have been actively supporting colleagues in the independent sector around their international recruitment, because we know that nurses on island are an issue. And by joining up those resources, whilst it doesn't impact directly on the salary that the individual receives, it does enable some of those similarities in terms of terms and conditions to already be explored. The second point I want to make in relation to the list is it was a list pulled together by the people in the room. They weren't all incredibly expensive executives in that room. We engaged with the voluntary sector. We engaged with care home providers. We had people who deliver frontline care there so that we could hear about what was important to them. And I'd be foolish not to mention that what was important to them wasn't always the money. The job satisfaction, the respect, the impact that they had in terms of discharging their roles was of equal importance to them as to how much money they, they made. Uh, one care worker particularly told me she doesn't go to work for her salary. She goes to work to make a difference. And I think we really need to remember that. We don't need to be in a position where we dumb down the situation we all do a job because we need an income, but actually there are other ways we can show how much we value this incredibly important workforce, as well as progressing those conversations about funding. You asked whether they were happening, and yes, they are. They're happening almost on a daily basis, it feels like at the moment, but the discussion around how we can utilise the island pound to support island workforce is one that's incredibly important to the three statutory organisations. Right, I've got Darren, Carl and Rodney and then Michael. Thank you, Chairman. Um, Laura, thank you very much for, for summarising what is excellent work. Councillor Mosler, I totally accept the challenge that um, that paper could have been written two or three times before and in different places, but the commitment, and probably has been, yeah, Laura's right, and probably has been, um, the fact of the matter is exactly what you described, which is we've got insufficient people to provide all the services that we need. And then I wrote down, uh, so what are the reasons for that? And the first one that I'd written down was terms and conditions. So I'm with you completely. And that is something that we do need to recognise and we do need to work out a plan of addressing. Uh, we've done some outline work, but it is a significant amount of money to, to, to level up rather than to do anything else. So to answer your specific question, we are aware. Do we have a plan? No, but we need to work on it. There are lots of other reasons. I think focus, working together, and to make sure some of the great things that Laura outlined around not just our young people, but in the examples that we've seen, our young people are very, very keen to come in and work. You know, the work that we're doing collectively with schools, colleges, education establishments generally is amazing and, and people, often say to me, well, I thought you had to be a doctor or a nurse to work in the health service. 
and you don't. We've got hundreds of different roles that are suitable for everybody. So I think we've got a real opportunity to build a grand groundswell of opinion. I agree with, with Laura, lots of evidence, hierarchy of needs and all that sort of stuff to talk about development being a massive factor for individuals and that, that realization of how you can provide some real value to, to, to what you're doing still comes back to can you pay your rent or can you pay your mortgage and can you have your food um, on the table, which is the real fundamental and that's what we've got to work through. Um, don't have an answer right now, but understand the problem. Carl? Yes, thank you for that. I, I agree. Um, it seems to me that over many years we've been awash with policy statements and bits of paper and and changing um, directions. I think this paper, paper does demonstrate that there is some equality and inclusion within it um, because you can see that it has been consulted with other people right across the board. Um, I think the proof is in the baking of the of the papers and having an outcome because it is about all the outcomes. We talk about the policies, but the inclusion of people and, and making sure that we actually re, um, reach the people that we need to. We have a huge um, volunteer sector on this island which we've become quite dependent on in many ways. We know it's not just about money because actually we're a small working, we have a small working population and a high level of need and that lead, need is growing and that's quite demonstrated in some of the other papers where it says that we've actually um, got more people now um, as volunteer carers. We've got 3,000 more uh, volunteer carers than we had in, sorry, without looking at the the debt, but in, since the last census, the previous census, and in this census, it shows 3,000 more. And I think that that is a huge problem. I think that the, the other issue is, is that we've had to deal with a, a crisis that's occurred, you know, at the beginning of COVID, which uh, Councillor Mosdale was involved in, in my position at that particular point, and I've inherited that. Um, and what's happening is that money has become absolutely critical and essential. Um, and even now, um, you know, we were talking about comms earlier. Sometimes we're not in charge of those comms. Those comms, we, we speak with people in our own meetings and then they have conversations and then that conversation comes out into the, into the community and that causes additional pressures on all of us. The, the fact is, is, is that we don't pay most people who are carers what they're worth. And you're absolutely right. It's about putting the food on the table. And at this point, people are having to make some very difficult decisions. I think this paper does try to do some of that. But actually, I think actually it would be nice to have some mild, um, key, key milestones put in there to say um, we will achieve this by or try to achieve that by and maybe adding some of those and these are outcome driven not not um, you know so we're saying so in order to address the issues which Councillor Mosdale raises about you know we, we keep going around the circle and say well actually by 2024 we will have done this and I think we need to harden up on that that is really difficult when you're in a crisis but but I think we can't solve the tomorrow we can solve the tomorrows further down the line because that's the part of the problem at the moment that would be my comment about this paper good well th thanks for that carl and thank you councillor mosdell for raising such a, uh, a a relevant question rodney thank you chairman yeah. i just want to ask laura when you're recruiting and you spoke about all these multiple forms that people got to fill in. How many people are put off by doing that such thing? Because I'm a big believer in getting people in front of people. Years ago, people just used to go for an interview. How are you going to know from filling in a form what people are actually like? It's like all these algorithms and things. How do they know? Thank you. Well done, Rodney. Thank you. You're absolutely right. And filling in forms is just one of those things that's part of everyone's everyday life and can be incredibly frustrating. If you're a person who wants to secure a job, 
as a care worker, the chances are you'll apply for every care vacancy that's out there. And at the moment, that means looking at the county press, looking at the internet and applying for employment opportunities with multiple different providers. It could be five, it could be 10, it could be 20. All of them are vacancies at the moment. So all of them are likely to want um, to receive your application. Each of those forms is also likely to be different because it meets the organisation's needs, not the applicant's needs. Through our Be The Difference website, we're standardising that. So you only need to put your details in once. You can add additional information that will be specific to the employer if you choose, but that's your choice. It does simplify everything and make it a much quicker process. And um, from the application comes the opportunity to meet somebody face to face, to have that interview, to gain that um, grounded view of what the person is like and whether they're a good fit for your organisation. But what we can do is streamline that front end of the process to make it easier for people to apply for jobs. Also easier for employers to evaluate those people against each other as part of their application processes. I do sympathise with Rodney though, because uh, in my day job in construction, if you rely just on form filling, you're going to miss some really good talent. Uh, Michael. <clears throat> I mean, thank you for for the work you're doing and the side. I think there's a difficult there's a difficult elephant in the room here, and the elephant in in the room is money. And unless you've got access to to the money, um, you can't actually um, put the added value ne needed to put to actually increase wages and side. And until uh, we get some equity between the island and the mainland, as done work done by Portsmouth University those years ago, and I know that there are a lot of talks behind the scenes to still get whatever you want to call it, the island deal, or I'd prefer to get legislation. We are always going to be uh, uh, in that difficult position of not necessarily having the money to pay for the people to do the job that actually they, they, they need to do. And I think we have to just be re realistic that we have to still be pushing, right, for that. And that also through like the LGA and through all the various systems, getting changes in government policy that really add up value adult social care. And, and, and we need to, really, really push that. We should be working together, perhaps the politicians cross party, to actually, you know, get our government to make the actual changes that will make someone who's 18 want to actually come in this profession and not actually go to Lidl, where they're going to get a much higher um, hourly rate, you right, know, right, within that. Well, I mentioned them, but other, other supermarkets that now actually pay more, more than actually you would as an adult social care worker. That's the reality of the world we live in. Good. Uh, Claire. Just to say I agree with, with especially with Councillor Mossell and the others, that it is a sort of an image thing for it, but it's also the, the money. You know, you've got to be paying the same. I've, I know lots of people that have said oh, NHS, it's the benefits, it's everything else that goes with it that would choose to that employment over others, but it's the general image of it as well. I think we need just to, to work on those. I think this I am the difference campaign would be really good. Do we have ambassadors to kind of put it out there that, you know, how valued these these jobs are? You could just go work in a shop, but what job satisfaction do you get from that and the, the added value for that for the, the whole community? So, yeah, it, I'd like to hopefully see some results. Councillor Critterton, um, the website is founded on testimonials for people who are already working in care from across our system. Um, the information, the richness of experience that they bring to people when considering an, a career in care is so important. It needs to be front and centre and it very much is. I wonder, Chairman, if the committee would like uh, an introduction to the Be The Difference website before it's launched. Um, it's currently just going through its final testing phases and we would be in a position to share with you what it looks like without the adverts for the jobs uploaded, obviously. I, I think but we'll definitely we put this on our work plan and you'll keep us updated with relevant information uh, through the informal meetings, Laura. Thank you very much for the offer. 
uh, which takes us nicely on to item. I, I, I wonder whether I'd maybe should be so bold through through you. I, I think this is an issue for scrutiny, but actually I think it's an issue for the wider uh, sort of think tank and brain trust across the whole island, to be honest. And I wonder whether there's some sort of joint session that we could organise in a relatively short order where all of like council, the organisations and various other people come together to start to think about how we might think longer term, not, not to disrupt or to change any of the actions that Laura described earlier on, but actually think about the value that we hold within the island and how we might maximise that as we go forward. Because it, it isn't just about the terms and conditions and adult social care, is it? It's not, is it? It's more than that. Okay. And I, I, I totally agree with you. I think I think the problem is is that we're, we're constantly firefighting, and whilst we have lots of policies and things, we we are we need to be thinking about the, what we'd like to do in three, five, seven years. We know that this immediate it, the pressure is now. There's no doubt about it. Is is that every time somebody wants that little bit more money in terms of salaries and wages and uptake, that adds pressure certainly to the finances on this, and I'm sure that does on on your side. We are fighting those fires all the time. We don't want to fight those fires because they're hot fires. We want to look forward and beyond that. And I think that we have to do that, otherwise we will all run out of steam. We certainly at this moment do not have the money to be, to go beyond where we currently are now in terms of all the levels. We want, we've want we already said we want to pay people more money. We do want to pay people more money because they deserve that money. But the fact is we don't have that money. So that then means that we've got to find creativeness. And sadly, that means every time somebody exceeds that 0.1%, you know, that means that something else has got to be cut at this time. We need to move to a position, and this is very much about government, really, where governments say the long term focus is, and we, we did think that we'd got that. Through, sorry, Chair, through, um, through um, Boris Johnson's announcements of having some money that we could see that was was coming that would give us a future. At this moment in time, we haven't got that again. That seems to be completely missing. And that doesn't allow us to plan for that big step change that we need to make, and we do need to make it. So, so there is, money is the elephant. You're absolutely right. Um, and... Um, and only by sitting down and working out what we're going to do. But the fact is, is, is you know, we're under pressure again now because obviously it's that time of year when um, our uplifts for carers, you know, our care services are there. We can't go beyond where we currently are. And I'm not permitted to make any more comment about that because it would be inappropriate at this time. Um, but again, you know, what we have is a media piece that's arrived today around that um, when we've not actually entered into any conversations of any significance at all. And that puts us on all under pressure um, from the beginning. But, you know, I agree. It, this isn't just about what we pay. This is about what society pays across the board to all of those other, whether it be superstores or councils or NHS or or private workers, we need to be able to have parity there, which then lifts us all completely. But at what level did you <clears throat> think this should be taken to, Darren? Uh, I didn't really have a solution. I just think perhaps outside the, the, the meeting, three, four, five of us could get together and think it through. Um, you know, I, I think this is about strategic planning, for, for want yeah. of a better phrase, and, and how we might take that kind of thing forward just thinking five, 10, 20 years time. I'm tired of thinking about tomorrow because tomorrow is a fight. What, I'm, what I would like to look forward to is the time when we've got sufficient funding instead of having 13 years of negative budget, which is what we've had in councils across all administrations, we've had 13 years of negative budget. What we need to do is say, actually it would be nice to have a budget for once that was actually in, in the positive numbers. Claire. So I probably can't remember, but Laura will be able to remember off the top of her head. And I know Dr. Tozer would have remembered off the top in the last 14 years, how many white papers and the, the great solution to the 
funding of adult social care and it doesn't matter what colour political pants you wear um, nobody's got the answer so I actually pretended to be the MP one day and got an invite to Westminster Dr Toes got me the invite um, and listened to different types of funding from adult social care from the German system for the Japanese system how they were going to fund it and and it was really fascinating but that was like three years ago so I think it's that tricky question that we could sit here till you know the next 20 years and actually it's not anything that anybody I have known of any sense I think the Lib Dems got a bit close to getting an answer to it last time at the last election but it's one of those things that we can sit here all evening but we won't get an answer at the moment the future funding as a whole of the NHS and adult social care it is that tricky issue that sadly everybody just kicks to the long grass whoever they are and how many white papers have there been Laura I regret to inform you Councillor Mustard I am not Dr Taser and I do not have data at the top of my head um, lots is the answer I think last count there was 11 <laughs> I, I hear what you're saying completely there, Councillor Mosdale, and, uh, and there's always a danger that we just repeat cycles and don't make progress. Um, I think my point was a wider one, though, because I don't think it just relates to adult social care. I think it relates to the disparity between, let's just say, a generic superstore um, and, and anything else or vice versa. And, and I think that's the debate that I think we need to start to think about. How do we value our people? Uh, you know, how many people leave the island for whatever reason, how many people come back. It's all of that kind of bigger picture stuff that I think is, is really something that we should start to get into. Not in scrutiny, but somewhere else. Interesting. Right, so now we'll go on to item A, carer's strategy. It's Laura again. It's me again. <laughs> Sorry, I think item eight is the Isle of Wight strategic partnership update. Is it? Oh, we've got a different. It's Kara's strategy on mine. Apologies, mind. we've got a different order on mine. Don't oh. worry, ignore me. I'll go again. Um, so before you as a committee, you have the proposed Kara strategy for 2023 to 2028 as a scrutiny committee I'm aware that you have engaged with local carers and um, as a result of your engagement it was felt appropriate that you were cited on the strategy before it moves to cabinet for approval on Thursday this week hence why it is here. Um, the strategy has been developed by our partners in the voluntary sector by people who are carers, by people who are cared for in our community and has been pulled together in a thoroughly co-produced way. Um, the strategy itself will be underpinned by an action plan, which clearly identifies how it will be implemented. And it is intended to be a system-wide strategy rather than just an Isle of Wight Council strategy. I'm aware that some of our partner organisations have already taken the paper through their governance structure and that it is supported by the local authority, by the ICB and by the Isle of Wight NHS Trust. What's key in the strategy and different from before is that the focus is around being as good as we can be. Our carer strategies in the past have been based in data. They focused on what we know of the community and have largely lacked in their aspirational stance. What we want to do through this strategy is really empower local people who have unpaid caring roles, informal carers, family carers, to be able to shape the care and support that they receive and that the person they care for also receives. There is a lot going on in the paper. The strategy itself is one that is quite detailed and I don't propose to take you through the information it is there for you in full. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions that you as a committee have in relation to the paper. Thank you, Michael. Um, Chair, I need to go shortly out to another meeting, but I just wish to endorse this report. I know the hard work that has gone in from Health Watch and from the Isle of Wight carers uh, in, in this, and I just really like to commend I mean, one of the things it says is priority three unpaid carers on the islands are supported so that their health and well-being 
uh, are improved. We we have a huge amount of unpaid carers, and if they didn't keep going, um, basically our whole health system would collapse. And often they are like a seesaw of they are uh, the carer is probably not that much more <laughs> right in their health needs than the person they're actually caring for. And, it, and it's a very difficult balancing act. And I think this strategy, what it's done is it's gone and talked to them and it's actually involved them. And I, I really commend, you know, commend this because it is actually coming from the hearts of the, of, of, of the people uh, within that. So, and so I haven't got any questions. I would like to actually I put down to that we as a committee should in, endorse it. Thank you. OK, Michael, so that's a proposal. Um, Joanna, did you want to say something before? Thank you. Yeah, I haven't got a question either. I, I just wanted to say it's a superb strategy. Um, um, it kind of leads on from the superb dementia strategy and the developmental model for the production of this strategy is why it's so successful because as Laura has said it the priorities are not based around data or assumptions or um, history it's purely based on the priorities of unpaid carers and the people they care for and that's why it's such an important strategy arguably one of the most important because as Michael Councillor Lilly said if unpaid carers fall down, then um, we are lost as as an island community um, because social care NHS services would not cope. So we have to support unpaid carers and the absolutely sterling work they do every day of the year, 24 hours a day. Um, and it's as, as always, it's in the um, implementation of the action plan. So it's all very well having um, a strategy, but it's um, what's delivered um, as part of that. So um, hopefully, again, in 12 months time, we can look back and speak to unpaid carers and get a really good response from them. But yeah, another just superb strategy. Yeah, I think we should move to just endorse this. Um, I've only got one tiny quick question that the strategy runs from 2023 to 2028. Um, I have read it. It's really good. Um, I like the fact that it's endorsed by, you know, Health Watch and uh, HUK, etc. When will you start reviewing that this is working and in place and embedded? As soon as it's signed off and adopted, um, we've got a template from the dementia strategy, which is standing us in really good stead, which is taking the principles of co-production from developing the strategy through to the principles of co-production through its implementation and evaluation and that will be the same for this strategy what we're intending to do is engage with informal carers right the way throughout the life of the strategy in terms of a, a final review if you like to look towards a replacement strategy in the future that will probably happen within the last 18 months of this strategy's lifetime but it's really important that people are engaged throughout what this can't be is a dusty document that sits on somebody else's shelf we've had so many strategies as a system a dusty documents that sits on people's shelves. We really need to see them delivering impact for local people and really having effect. So, uh, Darren and Carl. Thank you. Um, we completely support this. Lois has just said to me that we uh, took this through our governance process uh, fairly recently, completely and utterly support it. Um, and really importantly, it's how it's been created. That That's the key thing, uh, as Joanna said. Uh, I have to apologise, I think, to the committee because um, Councillor Robertson, Councillor Nicholson and I were involved in a venture uh, panel Q&A session a week or two ago, and I just happened to be given a number of the copies of the carer strategy, and I was happily passing it around the audience prior to any formal sign-off. So apologies for that, but I was so impressed with it, and so were the recipients of that strategy, that um, I thought I probably just needed to apologise. <laughs> I'm yeah. sure, sorry, Councillor, I'm sure, Darren, that we could have provided you with copies of the dementia strategy to hand out. It was both. It would have been easier. <laughs> Laura, it was both. It was both. And Joe's got a copy there. <laughs> I, 
I just wanted to just clarify because the number of our, um, in the last census, um, which has increased by 3,000, is 19,757 people. So that's 19,750 people that we would have to care for in addition to where we currently are now if it wasn't for all of these absolutely amazing carers. Um, and so you're quite right that the whole system would collapse. But I think it's their story that we need to be on top of and we need to be trying as far as we can to offer more support to the carers of, of those that they care for because many of them are quite elderly. And I can think of one 85-year-old uh, man who's looking after his wife who's in her 90s and um, want to maintain their dependence. And I get that completely. And they are the people that we need to try and move forward and support further in order to, um, to keep going. But I think there's some real recognition of those stories that need to be put there. And again, I'm a big one for milestones. Let's see some milestones of what we actually want to. We want to do this by X and that by X. But I support this. Uh, Thank you. So we've had a proposal that we endorse it. We've had a seconder that we endorse it. And did you want to say something, Joe? I'm seconding it, Chair. Um, and we'll just go to the vote. So those in favour? Bacon has read with Michael supported it. Um, now we go to Isle of Wight strategic partnership update, and that is Isabel, I believe. Yeah, thank you very much. I'll give a very quick overview of strategic partnerships and then hand over to colleagues to talk about various parts of it in more of the theme of working together, really. Um, so as an integrated care system for Hampshire and the Isle of Wight, our goals are to essentially to keep people as healthy and independent as possible and to provide swift access to care um, for high quality care for those who need it. Um, and there are many challenges, as I'm sure you're all very well aware, in achieving those goals for the Isle of Wight population. The, um, the, the physical isolation of a relatively small population for the nature of the services we're providing um, and also the health inequalities faced by some of the communities on the island and, and so on and so on. So as such, the Isle of Wight Sustainability Partnerships are um, part of one of the three key programmes for um, the integrated care system as a whole, because they bring together partners to respond to those challenges um, and to work together to achieve the goals for, for the population of the Isle of Wight. There are four key elements to it. Um, there's the Isle of Wight as a place and bringing together um, the various parties to make sure we respond to the population's needs. And I'll in a moment ask um, Michelle to talk a bit more about the health and care partnership, which has all bit already been referred to several times in this meeting. Um, as you will well understand, mental health and community services are absolutely key to achieving the goals I mentioned at the very beginning for the population and there's work across the whole of Hampshire and the Isle of Wight bringing together the providers of those um, services together into a single trust and I think Leslie um, can talk. Um, there's the acute partnership um, between Portsmouth Hospitals and the Isle of Wight Trust um, which Darren can talk about and the proposals to bring those two trusts together in a, a, together as two trusts in a group. Um, and then I don't think we talk about it specifically today, but there is the ambulance partnership as well with um, South Central Ambulance Service. So together they cover the various angles of health and they bring together partners to achieve those goals. But rather than talk any further, I'll hand over to Michelle. Thank you. Thanks, Isabel. Um, I'm just going to talk about the um, health and care partnership on the island. Um, which I've been um, involved with actually from its inception. Um, I'm not sure that's necessarily a good thing, but I have. Um, and um, it's it started uh, to begin with as, as um, a fallout from um, when we were doing a whole system review where a group of people were quite involved with that. And actually we continued to meet quite regularly. And then we decided that we would form a, a board where actually we were looking particularly at island issues. Uh, making sure that we um, had um, as much representative as we possibly could. Um, 
moving forward, um, we are presently um, shaping the um, Isle of Wight Health and Care Board to be two boards, really. One is a partnership board, which I'm really excited about. Um, we're widening the partnership um, so that we've got um, uh, wider partners in the room so we can have their experience and expertise to, to uh, support us um, in our strategies and making sure that we're delivering uh, what we said we would do. Uh, but importantly, um, that partnership will have um, a role in making sure that any of these partnerships that we're talking about, particularly Fusion and particularly um, the grouping with Portsmouth, making sure that Islanders are um, first and foremost um, in those people's thoughts when they start looking at how we're looking at services for the island. Um, another part of the uh, Health and Care Board will be a, a smaller executive group uh, which the partnership part will uh, hold accountable for making sure that we deliver um, on, on what we've said that we would deliver. I think it's a really exciting time and a really important role for the Isle of Wight Health and Care Board to be um, overseeing uh, services and health and care for islanders. So uh, I'll hand over to Leslie now. Thank you. Um, so in terms of uh, Project Fusion, which is the name we've given to the uh, programme to bring together community mental health and learning disability services across Hampshire and the Isle of Wight. I know this committee um, has heard about uh, this a, a couple of times before and is um, familiar with the, um, the programme. Uh, we're making good progress. Um, on Thursday this week, our uh, trust board is going to be um, taking the strategic case uh, in our private board. Um, it's already been to the boards of the other three trust boards, uh, trusts that are involved in the programme um, for sign off. And once it's got, been through all four, it will be submitted to NHS England to start the uh, formal process of developing the new organisation. Um, the strategic case uh, is summarised in the papers that you have, and you see it goes through uh, the rationale, uh, looks at the options that um, we considered, talks about the clinical strategy, and in particular, um, the clinical priorities that we're focusing on um, at the moment, um, and it sets out a timeline. In terms of next steps, uh, once the strategic case is, is uh, submitted, we continue with the clinical work, we continue with the engagement that's happening across all of our staff groups in the, the organisations with our partners um, our stakeholders and really importantly with the people who use our services uh, and their families and carers. Um, and the focus will start to really turn to what do we want this organisation to be, um, what culture do we expect it to have, what will it feel like to work in this new organisation and how do we create um, that um, the right culture within uh, this is a, a, a real opportunity for us to do something new and creative. Um, the expectation is that the full business case will be completed over um, the course of the summer and by October will be uh, ready for submission. And around that time, we expect to start to be able to operate in shadow format in line with the plan to um, go live on the 1st of April 24. Um, so we're on track. It's, a, it's still, a, I think, a very challenging timetable to form a new organisation. Um, but uh, we're, we're on track. We're very well engaged from an island perspective in all aspects of the work and continue to be very positive about the way that it's developing. Thank you, uh, Chairman. Thanks, Leslie. Thank you, uh, Isabel and Shell. So um, from a trust perspective, I'm going to talk specifically about the acute partnership with Portsmouth. So that's between the Isle of Wight Trust and Portsmouth. Um, some years ago, as outlined in the paper, the organisation trust recognised that it was too, too small to continue to provide sustainable services to the population of the island. It, that's just a, a, a fact. When, when you look at it in comparison with a number of other organisations across the country, it's just a, a simple fact. Um, and therefore, to stand alone, to continue to try and provide those sustainable services was not going to not going to be possible. So we entered into a number of strategic partnerships with neighbouring organisations, and I think colleagues have mentioned those earlier on. But to avoid any doubt, that's the SCAS Ambulance Partnership. It's the what was Solent, but now is uh, Southern 
um, and, and one or two others, I won't label that, um, for community and mental health services and for acute services, it's Portsmouth. Those strategic partnerships have been in place for a while and we've seen some considerable benefits from each of those partnerships. As we've improved our services and our ratings to our population, uh, we've instilled greater confidence with our regulators. Not all of that, and certainly a large part of that in certain cases, has been down to our partnership arrangements with other organisations, both on and off the island. The acute aspect is, is what I'll talk about now, and, and really this is about how we maintain services for local people. And I know there are lots of uh, thoughts, worries and anxieties for people about services being removed from the island and going to the mainland. This is not what we're talking about. As we are unsustainable, as I described earlier on, we cannot continue to provide all of those services for everybody all of the time. We have to work with our partners to be able to do that. We are talking about maintaining services for local people at a local level. If we have to change any of those services as we go forward in the future, then there's clearly an absolute requirement and an absolute focus and necessity from our perspective to consult with every uh, an, an appropriate member of our community as we move forward. Absolute firm and total commitment. What we're talking about now is a change in a management arrangement between arrangements between the two organisations. So we're talking about how do we appoint a single leadership team between the two organisations and retaining the two statutory organisations with statutory responsibility as we move forward. So a single team starts with a single chief executive and then a single executive team. And then incredibly importantly, it starts to introduce a single clinical leadership team. So how do we have a single person responsible for delivering clinical services across the two organisations to ensure that we've got an opportunity at a much bigger scale to continue to provide the services that we see here on the island. That's the fundamental point that as we move forward, um, recognising that people may well have some concerns about a loss of service or a loss of control. We see this as a positive thing. Uh, we also know that there are lots of uh, anxieties or frustrations or uh, disappointment or disagreement with travel arrangements as they currently stand. So we have a very firm commitment working across the system again as part of the Island Health and Care Partnership Board. Um, and I've just come in before. I can almost hear Councillor Mosdell's. Oh, you've got a different question. OK, we'll come back to that in a second. Um, but <laughs> I'm prepared for that one. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but that Island Health and Care Partnership Board really does need to focus on resolving the transport issues. Uh, and we've given a commitment to do that. And we've already made some progress uh, in the last couple of weeks. So that that's the sort of positive thing here. Uh, but recognising there may be some some questions uh, as we move forward. But I'll leave it there, Chair, and happy to pick Thank up any questions. Thank you very much, Councillor Mosner. There's a couple of questions. So currently, what is Portsmouth CQC rating as hospital? Portsmouth has a good CQC rating. Across all areas? Uh, well. No, it has a, requires improvement. It's safety improvement. Um, I've always been quite agreement with this because if I'm going to have a major operation, I want to have it done by somebody who does loads of them, you know, every day of the week rather than, you know, having an operation that someone might do once a month or once every six months. Um, yes, my question will always be about transport um, and I think I asked you last time when we were having an informal meeting that we could have a regular update on transport because that's something that actually does need to go into the media to give reassurance and assurance for people who that is their major concern not just because of the money but actually how is that journey going to be made as safe and as comfortable as possible you know there is nothing you want to do when you're unwell you know traveling back from major surgery you know on a rough day on a ferry that's actually really busy and you're you know the ferry's overbooked and there are so many other complications and they aren't just financial so you know i have mentioned it before i think we'd really appreciate it's committee that we could see regular updates on how those tricky issues are being resolved 
I, you know, I'm quite clear that, you know, in some cases there won't be as many journeys required, you know, and and some of those answers we need to come to the committee is that things like blood tests can be done over here and people aren't making unnecessary journeys. But as this is a, you know, a meeting that goes into the media, it would be really good to use it, as I said, to give that reassurance and assurance that you really are on it and covering not just the cost, but the difficulties of those journeys and how much of that unnecessary journeys can be taken out of it. And I know you've got the answers, but you know, the, the press are behind you, tapping away. It'd be nice to people to know the answer. Thank you, Councillor Mosdo. Uh, I think I've been quoted several times actually already um, in the uh, the local media and uh, perhaps rather than me say something again, um, I can just roll out those quotes and happy to, to work that through. Um, but the commitment remains that we need to address the current issues for transport and that will address any future issues for transport. And that's the commitment that I think we need to give. And that's the commitment that I think we give through the Island Health and Care Partnership Board. Um, I note your comment there about uh, specialism. Um, and if we're having uh, particular care or treatment, then we want that care or treatment to be provided by the specialists uh, wherever we can. But recognising that that's in the minority of cases as opposed to the majority of cases which is about how we deliver care locally to the local population. So we need to maintain that balance between where you need specialist care, the right place, but actually where you need generalist care, then that's a local service for local people. So I just think it's important to add that actually for many years, um, particularly specialisms have already been provided off island. Um, renal, um, uh, urology, um, you would have your prostate operation done at QA. And we already have um, processes in place to make sure that islanders don't do unnecessary visits for blood tests and investigations. So a lot of those are already well established. So quite often you would maybe have an investigation done at St Mary's, but actually that would be that image would then be sent over to Southampton. And so a lot of those processes are already in place. And I think this actually gives us an opportunity to highlight what works well and what doesn't work well and make sure that we get those processes in place for islanders to make it as easy as possible and to make sure that they're accessing high quality care but obviously always quality care act as close to home as possible thank you now i can remember a meeting sat with dr leg once and we were giggling about having an an ambulance boat and then actually halfway through the giggling we realized actually that would be a really good idea to have an ambulance boat a dedicated ambulance boat and um, i just want to answer and you don't have to answer this and it's probably a little bit flippant but you know hey ho um do you think if we had this huge amount of funding from government to come in and have a bridge put in or a tunnel across um, my feeling has always been that actually we would be downgraded as a hospital and we would become, because of the amount of population that we have here, that we would become just the size of like a district services and a lot of our services would automatically go to those larger hospitals that with a bridge or a tunnel were only 12 minutes away. Just hypothetical, just wondered. Do you want me to answer that, Chair? Um, question. Entirely up to you. Completely Dave. hypothetical question and a completely hypothetical answer. Um, there are lots of hospitals that are further away from each other on the mainland that do not provide all of the care all of the time to their population. <clears throat> I, th I think under a, this item, it's worth making the comment, indeed, observation that um, how you explain things, Darren, is very easy to understand. And why wouldn't you want to do what is being proposed? How official communications um, lay out what is happening um, gives rise, promotes um, suspicion and uh, doubt amongst the uh, amongst the island certain sectors of the island population and I think we've seen that in 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 certain areas and it, it's entirely predictable because because um, you know people living on an island um, 
I worried about those things. So it's just a, a, a comment to, to make, Carl. Thank you. I mean, God forbid that people would ever have to go off the island for blood tests. I mean, that really would be the end of the of the whole of the whole uh, situation. The ambulance boat. We did try an ambulance boat in 1998, and everybody was so violently ill and sick on it because it bounced about like you know, we just had major operations, and it lasted all of about a month, if I remember rightly, um, particularly the cancer patients who were very, very ill from, from that. So that's not a solution, but I do take the point that there needs to be some work with our ferry companies so that there is a controlled space which is uh, virus free. And we have all asked for that, haven't we, for a very long time and got absolutely nowhere. Um, with that and that that really does need to be I think the question of all of this is about in in how we uh, it comes down to communication again it really does come down to communication and you know you have to look at it from a resident's point of view the system did work before and now all of a sudden it doesn't work well it doesn't work because people need because treatments have changed and they're more complicated and our specialist nurses are absolutely wonderful and so why would you see a, a gp and it comes back to the word change but the failure on our part is how we communicate it that is the in a way that people understand not a clinical model particularly and you're absolutely quite right people have always gone off this treatment off the island for for treatment, you know, I wouldn't want just as the same as you know when I had my cancer treatment. I wouldn't want somebody who was playing with it two or three times. And we we regularly get the same questions: Why can't we have uh, radiotherapy on the island? Well, that's because there isn't the scale of economy. Firstly, and and secondly, you want somebody that's doing that particular radio treatment, like knitting every day. So so that's the bit that needs to be needs to be sold here. I think if my only real gripe about this is about is that we're not communicating with the people of this island properly about it i didn't know that you were going to make that announcement that you did and that shocked me because if you know if we're talking about partnerships then the partnership really does need to know about that and we didn't know about that and that then brought us a lot of really difficult questions which makes us angry because that's what happens it makes us angry when we don't know what's happening and I think that's the same for the island people is that they're feeling some of them not all of them are feeling angry so we need to be better at communicating this is why it's happening and it needs to be spelled out very very clearly we're spending this money in this particular way because the long-term benefits outweigh the short-term difficulties that's what I would say about it sorry I need to ask a question now so I'm now really concerned because I've just spent um, an hour and 40 minutes of my life in this meeting listening to how we're all working together and it's all a partnership and um, and everybody communicates and everything. Um, and I would have thought this is a major point of work, that it would be top of the agenda of the meetings. How often does the, what was the local care board that was the JC, you know all the things. I, I would have thought that isn't that meeting once a month and it was communicated and the cabinet member should have known that if he was sorry so i would have thought this Yeah, I just want assurance that the cabinet member is involved in the care board to the level that you should have been aware of that. So just to be clear, um, as the chair of the Isle of Wight Health and Care uh, Board, um, it was discussed at the board. I think what um, Councillor Love is saying is that the, the actual comms came out quite quickly. Um, and, and actually, to be clear to members of this board, we've been talking about this since about 2016. And services, um, clinical services, particularly acute clinical services, have been reviewed several times to look at their sustainability and financial viability. And so there has been quite a long journey. But to answer Councillor Mosdale's uh, question, it is a standing item at the Isle of Wight Health and Care Board. I think it was the 
the rate of the communication, I think, is 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 um, the issue here, not actually the fact that we've not been talking about it, which we have done over the last year or so, at least. Sorry, I have another question. So sorry. Um. So do we still have a joint com officer? It used to be Kirk that we used to be a joint. Do we no longer have a joint com officer between the council and? Um, no. There is no longer a joint position. No, it was Kirk. Did it? I'm looking at Darren now, and I think the noise that has been generated over this communication has been noted and and uh, uh, and it, it, we're, it's been looked at how it could have been done better. Perhaps. Uh, completely, Chairman. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to take the endorsement of scrutiny to move forward, but the clear recognition that the way the communication was handled could have could change in the future. Thank you. Uh, next item is proposals to vary, develop and consult upon service changes. Item 10. So this is, um, have I missed something else? No, no. No. It's uh, uh, elective surgery hub and uh, dementia beds. And I seem to remember we lost some dementia beds and quite rightly so because the service, uh, the culture of the service that was being provided at the time was was uh, pretty damning. Um, and those beds were never replaced. Um, but now we're talking about replacing them. So Leslie, would you like to enlighten us on that, please? Uh, yes, very, very happy to. What I wanted to do is update you on um, the plans to develop uh, mental health dementia beds on the island. Um, as you say, uh, we've had to rely on mainland mental health dementia beds since 2019 when Shackleton closed. Um, one of the benefits of closing Shackleton was that it allowed us to invest in the dementia outreach team, which is a community based team that supports people with dementia and their families and carers where they live, um, whether that's in their own home or care, care homes or nursing homes. Um, and that has been an incredibly successful model um, to the point that actually it's, we're sharing it with our partners in Project Fusion because we think um, it would benefit Hampshire residents as well. Um, the number of people requiring mainland mental health dementia beds has significantly reduced. And we're now at a point where we think that we can provide those beds on island. We're therefore planning a pilot that's just starting now to uh, deliver the beds on what is currently, or up till this point, has been um, an older people's mental health inpatient unit, not for people with dementia, but for people with wider mental health problems. Um, in order to care for people with dementia as well within that environment, there are a number of changes we'd need to make. Uh, we've reduced the number of beds on that ward from 10 to 8 in order to give us the space. And often when people with dementia require mental health admission, it's to do with their levels of agitation and distress. And so you need space. You also need really specialist nursing and we've provided um, uh, additional training for our nursing staff who are already actually on that ward have got very significant um, skills around dementia. Um, and uh, we're, we're also slightly shifting the way that the dementia outreach team works so that they are in reaching to the ward um, to support people as they go in and to make sure that they're discharged early. We're also talking to um, a private provider about developing some step up and step down beds, which I think really is kind of belt and braces to make sure that we absolutely can can manage uh, with the demand on the island without needing to go um, to, to mainland beds. And that would allow um, us to, uh, or the dementia outreach team, to identify people who are at risk of admission, but go into a, 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 a nursing, a specialist nursing home first with the dementia outreach team supporting and only if they can't be managed in that environment would they then go into seven acres um, and that environment would allow people to be discharged earlier as well um, so i think it's it's a good 
overall clinical pathway. Uh, we want to really test it. Um, and uh, so the pilot will happen over the next six months. Um, and what we'd like to do is to come back to overview and scrutiny with the outcome of that, um, the evaluation of the pilot. Um, and that should give us uh, a, a kind of direction of travel um, for a more permanent service and solution. I only have one quick question. Um, when you're developing this, are you making sure that there is an outside space that is available? Because when I visited Shackleton and actually it was, they couldn't see daylight or anything. Can you just explain? Because some of these nurse, the high impact residential homes at least have an outside space and a sensory garden and stuff like that. Will you be incorporating that sort of thing? Um, it, so this is going to go to Afton Ward, which is one of the wards in 7A, because it already has um, a, a garden uh, that has been redeveloped over the last four or five years um, that is absolutely a suitable space for people um, with dementia. Um, and as we're reducing the number of bedrooms um, from 10 to 8, that will give us some more in, in side space as well. Um, so, yes. Uh, so, just a brief update on the elective hub. Uh, we progressed through the governance process to develop the hub. Um, the committee will be aware this is a proposal to uh, provide uh, consolidated uh, orthopaedic services uh, in Winchester. Uh, we had a conversation, I think, Councillor Love, you were quite um, uh, vocal. Was I, I was looking for the right word. Um, you were quite vocal, yes, uh, about patients needing to travel. Um, as we go through the governance process of this, we need clearly again to consult and, and be aware of feedback. Um, our issue, of course, remains that providing some services on the island is a challenge and therefore providing those specialist services I described earlier on uh, at a different location could be an answer as we go th through our governance and our consultation period. But that's all to come in terms of information and, uh, and sharing of communication. Joanna. Thank you. I've just got a couple of questions about the dementia beds. Um, we we also visited Shackleton Ward in um, 2019 um, and reported concerns. So I just wonder whether there is any learning from the experience of that ward um, that will go into the new pilot. Um, so um, looking at what didn't work at Shackleton and how you're going to kind of address those issues um, with the pilot. Also, um, how will the project be evaluated? So are you talking to patients um, and their families, that kind of thing? Um, but I just also wanted to add that it's really positive that the bed's coming back to the island because mm. that's what people are telling us they absolutely want. And we know that some um, unpaid carers are making decisions on accessing support um, based on the understanding that their loved one may have to go to the mainland for treatment and that's putting them off getting help because they really don't want that. Um, and, and, and also, if the pilot is successful, will you be consulting with the public? Because this will be a significant change in service provided. Um, so it's important that the service is what, what people, local people want and what they feel they need. So, just to jump around a bit, <laughs> those questions, I'm really sad to hear that anybody would be put off seeking um, care because of a fear of going to the mainland. The number of people that require mental health inpatient um, beds for dementia are tiny. Um, you know, it, it's more likely that people are going to St Mary's. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the very, very small number that have um, very specific specialist mental health needs. Um, and so uh, the vast, vast majority of people with dementia would never go anywhere near one of those services. And since we've had the dementia outreach team in place, many fewer than have um, have been in the past uh, have required inpatient care. Um, in terms of the lessons learned around Shackleton, then yes, absolutely. Um, there, are, there are a number of lessons, but they're, they're kind of one of the key things, I think, for Shackleton um, 
was that it was very physically isolated from Seven Acres. It was in the middle of the acute hospital next to a surgical ward. Um, and the, the staff group there were isolated from their mental health colleagues. Um, it also had a very high number of vacancies. Um, and uh, I, I think that was part of the difficulty that we were uh, dealing with bank and agency staff who were, had a high turnover all the time. Afton Ward is a, a brilliant ward. If you, I mean, you'll you'll be aware of that. The, the CQC have always been very complimentary around Afton. They have very strong clinical leadership, uh, a good history of uh, recruitment and retention of staff, good staff training and development. So it's an entirely different um, situation. And then in terms of change so I, I'm I'm not convinced it's um, a significant service change that requires consultation we're continuing to develop to deliver inpatient care it's a different physical environment we've moved from St Mary's into um, Afton Ward um, but it would still be delivery of the same service um, within a different ward and I, I completely agree with you around the need for engagement um, and uh, absolutely the feedback from service users and their families will be an important part of the evaluation um, and an important part of developing this plan. Now you, you be aware that we um, have uh, service user engagement coordinators assigned to all of our services now and certainly uh, we'll have a service user engagement coordinator who's been involved in developing this plan so far and will be involved in the evaluation. So we'll, we'll continue with that engagement. So I think, well, I, my view is it's engagement required rather than formal consultation. OK, yep, Carl. Thank you. I'm, I'm so pleased to hear that we're making progress with the dementia. I think I think that it's you know it, it's a positive thing that you know the people of the island want to see their loved ones kept on the island and um, for all kinds of different reasons and we all know those. So I think that that's a really positive thing. My problem with the with the hub wasn't the fact that we were having a hub. My problem with the hub is where it is, you know. Um, and despite me. I'm not the only one, there are other people that make, make objections as well, saying that it was completely inappropriate for it to be based all the way up there, um, particularly when you think about the journey that people have to make to an elective hub. Um, you know, somebody from Ventnor has to have a bus, then they have to go by sea, then they have to go by train in order to get there in time to have a procedure, to then to be able to get home, having had that procedure. That's the issue. Um, in addition to the cost, I mean, and the travel and the other things, but the real issue is that is that journey that people have to take, and that's the bit that I object to because I think that that is totally unacceptable for island people, particularly for somebody who is frail, who needs a second person to support them. That's the bit that's wrong, and that's why I objected to it because I think that it, it could have been based in Portsmouth. It could have been placed in Southampton, somewhere where people could have had a reasonable journey. But of course, the powers that be, which is not about blaming anybody sitting here, because the powers that be made that decision. And that was the wrong decision for the people of this island. And I think that that will come back to bite us in the bum because that will stop people. It's the journey, not necessarily the cost. And there are a lot of people, which you've already highlighted, who have never even been off this island. And we need to do more to encourage people to, you know, to, to fly, so as to say. Um, but yeah, and, that, and that's the problem because, because in actual fact, depending when those appointments are going to be, you know, that will mean that somebody might have to stay out overnight and that's got a cost to it. So it's those are the things that concern me about this more than anything else. So I'm looking forward to hearing about some of the solutions to that problem, because that is a very specific problem, not the treatment. I'm not doubting the treatments. I'm doubting the the journey. And that's the bit that concerns me. We'll put patient transport in the work plan for updates, Carl, regular. Yeah. So we've got Darren and then I've got Rodney. Thank you. Um, as ever, I'm grateful to Council of Love for, for raising the, the nub of the issue, which isn't the treatment, you're right. It's about how do we ensure adequate and appropriate transport and travel arrangements to 
um, to for. Oh. Um, sorry, did everybody hear that? Or yeah. need to repeat? Didn't I have? Goodness. Um, so, how do we arrange appropriate travel and transport arrangements? Again, it's the similar theme to the, the, the issue that we were talking about earlier on. So, that's the takeaway from today, I think. How do we get that back into the work plan to ensure that we've got adequate progress? Well, th there are all sorts of potential solutions, aren't there? It works well. Check. It's not just about that. So, there is lots of things that are often we've discussed for years about actually having a really good leaflet that whatever your trip that's in yes. gp surgeries and everywhere because lots of people don't actually know what's available now and how you do things it's not just about how we fund it it's how do we communicate if so say for example you had a diagnosis that you had lung cancer your world would fall to pieces wouldn't it but you won't be able to think straight if you can be given a leaflet that says this is how you travel. This is how you can get the funding. This is how we can make it safe because lots of the stuff is in place. It's just people don't know about it. And we've said for years it would be really easy to just maybe commission Health Watch to write a leaflet embracing everything that is already on offer that people can just be given. And to me, it's just such a simple decision. And then add to it. Add to all the extra bits that you're going to bring on board and the extra funding, but nothing is communicated in a simple, this is what is already here, this is what is available. You know, just from simple things, patient travel from freshwater to, you know, St Mary's, all of that should just be in a simple how-to that can be handed out when someone's legs gone out from underneath them, when they have had, you know, that they know that they've got something wrong with them and need to be treated. So it isn't just about what we do in the future, it's about communicating what you do now. Sorry. Uh, so uh, in the interest of time, I completely agree with all of the councillors' comments, um, and that's going to be part of the work plan. Uh, uh, sorry, that's wrong. Of course I agree with the councillors' comments. In the interest of time, I won't say any more. Thank you. What do you do? No, you don't don't do. I was just going to ask about the when we talk about engagement or formal consultation and what the difference was because I was just a bit confused about that and, and public would be I you know as a member of the public thinking why would you do one and not the other is it a cost is it a budget issue and as to why what would be the effectiveness of it because obviously people want to know they want consultations they want to be consulted about the services providing thank you before so um you know it, in our eyes when Shackleton ward was closed if if any ward hospital ward is closed there should be a public consultation around that so it should have happened then it didn't so we would really appreciate although legally um we're four years too late we still feel it's in the public interest to be able to comment on this because it doesn't affect many people, but it has a huge effect on those people and their families. Yeah, and I totally agree that um, it's really important that people have got an opportunity to have their say. I guess the difference in a formal um, a formal consultation is a formal process through overview and scrutiny um, and engagement. We'd expect an engagement uh, with service users, staff, other stakeholders to happen on any change. And there are particular criteria around what kind of service change requires a formal consultation. So uh, the question is, and I, I, I agree, Joe, I think we, we were kind of overtaken by events with a, um, the initial closure of Shackleton um, was uh, an, an urgent issue raised by the CQC. Um, and we've I think we've drifted partly through COVID and various other things. And, and also, I think we were struggling to find an on-island solution. And we have now found, we think, an on-island solution. Um, that I, I think if, this end, if the long-term solution had been off-island, then we would still be in a situation of substantial service change. But actually, what we're doing now is something that allows us some continuity back with where we were, which in my view is not as therefore a substantial service change requiring consultation but i guess that's a technicality for the overview and scrutiny committee to advise on i wonder why following councillor's very helpful question uh, at some stage in the 
uh, not too distant future, we just probably review consultation versus engagement as a as almost like a policy position, but for scrutiny, just to remind everybody exactly where we are, because otherwise we'll just end up with further confusion as we go forward. I don't know if that's helpful or not, Joe, as a general thing rather than specific for Shackleton or anything else. That'd be very helpful. Good. So we'll round off with a really good news story, CQC inspections. Um, Thank you, Chair. Yeah. Just checking I have the right microphone this time. Um, yes, the maternity services at the Trust were last inspected in 2018. It was good in all domains apart from safe and well-led, which led to um, an overall rating of requires improvement, because quite rightly those two domains are weighted. Uh, members of the committee may well be aware that there have been a number of national reports concerning maternity safety, Ockenden Part 1 and Part 2, and the East Kent report, which emphasised um, the importance not just of safety and the data relating to safety, but also a good culture of safety and a good culture of speaking up about safety. In response to those reports, the CQC has created a focused inspection programme looking at safe and well-led domains around the country, and the Trust had its inspection in late October and early November. And I'm very pleased to report, as set out in the papers, that the Commission found that there'd been improvements in those domains, leading to a good overall rating for the Trust, which is um, very commendable. I think it's of particular note that the Commission is very risk averse about maternity uh, services and rating them and endorsing them publicly at the moment, particularly in the light of those um, Ockenden and East Kent reports. So it's a particularly pleasing outcome for the island and I hope gives great confidence to service users that the quality of the service is so significantly improved. Um, outstanding practice um, about learning and development and contribution it plays in safety was identified in the report. That's at page 95 of the pack. There were two should do items um, identified which the trust had put right before the inspection even ended. Um, and we hope that this, as I say, will give great confidence to people who use our services because, as we have noted, you don't have much choice. There's very little time involved, generally speaking, in order to make um, decisions about where you might choose to have your baby. Um, we have been joined, Chairman, by um, Amanda Pearson, who's our Director of Midwifery, and Anne Pennells, who is our Head of Midwifery, to answer any questions that um, committee members may have. So I will um, make them available to you if you wish to do so. I don't think there's any questions, but I think we'd formally like to congratulate uh, on that. Yeah, uh, so well done. Thank you very much, Chairman. We're incredibly pleased. Amanda and Anne, the credit goes to you and the teams, not to us, mm. uh, but thank you so much. Thank you for joining us. Right, so that... Trusted care. Trusted care. Not bored of me yet, which is great. So in terms of the um, information before you around the trusted care report, it was really to draw to your attention some um, significant improvements that the Isle of Wight has seen since the report was last produced. Trusted Care are an independent organisation who review and evaluate CQC ratings for independent sector providers up and down the country. And um, when we were first reviewed and evaluated by trusted care, um, we were found somewhat lacking in terms of our position as a local authority area and were decidedly towards the bottom of their rankings. Um, that obviously had quite a negative impact, not only on people looking to source care and support on the island, but also on our workforce working in those sectors. We utilised some one-off funding from central government under the Improve Better Care Fund to develop a partnership with Mount Batten uh, to look at how we can support the independent sector to raise the standards of the services that they were delivering to local people. That 
programme has been operating now for the last four years. It's been open and free to all independent care providers on the island, to the owners of those businesses, the registered managers, their deputies, but also to aspiring managers in those settings. And I'm delighted that a significant proportion of the independent sector marketplace has taken us up on that brilliant opportunity. Although delivered by Mountbatten, there are members of all of our teams who engage really proactively with that program. Um, the ICB's Medi medicines management team, quality assurance team, colleagues from the trust, uh, colleagues from the fire service also engaged in delivering part of that program. So it really is a true multidisciplinary uh, approach to supporting improvement in the quality of care on the island. CQC CQC ratings were reviewed by Trusted Care just before Christmas and the Isle of Wight now finds itself ranked number one in the country for the quality of care delivered by our independent sector. Um, having moved from a position where only around 60% of our market had secured good or outstanding ratings through the CQC, we are well above the national average now benchmarking high in the 90s. So great news for our local care providers, fantastic news for their incredibly dedicated staff and brilliant news for us as a local authority and our partners for the work that we've been able to put in to support that really important part of our sector. I think the most important thing to note uh, for the committee today is the direct impact that improvement in quality of care has for people who receive that care and support and for their families because we want for everyone the best experience possible when they need care and support and the CQC's evaluation of our local services shows that that's what's now being delivered on the island. Incredible achievement or a really total reverse of the table so well done really well done I know all the hard work that you personally put in as well so you know much appreciated. So work plan. So we, we've we've added a number of items to the work plan, and we've also been asked at last full council if we could put something in on full prevention, um, as um, <clears throat> as that as that, oh, well Simon's gone now, but it was um, preventative uh, actions to stop people coming into hospital, going to see their GP was is quite important. So uh, that's it. Is there anything else that we need to add? No? OK, well, that's it. Thank you very much for all your contributions. Last question time. Members question time. Can I just thank Paul for being just amazing scrutiny? I think this is your last meeting with us, isn't it? And You've got corporate scrutiny, but I think this is the last time and, and, and many of the people sat here have seen how well you've managed things over the years. And I for one would like to say, you know, really appreciate it. Um, and I think the chair should add something to now, but this is this is actually and I hope you enjoy your retirement. Well, Paul's kept this very quiet and he, <laughs> he's, he, he, he's a person that doesn't like a lot of fuss, but I have to say that uh, he's he's regarded by people with a lot more experience than me as one of the best scrutiny officers in the country and it's been an absolute pleasure working with Paul um, and it's it's been work and it's been fun Paul because we've 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 we we feel we've we've done something and I think we've yeah. worked really closely as a team and you will be missed um and uh, I'll still peep my horn whenever I go past your farm. Uh, and uh, you know, I think the committee and everybody here present uh, wishes to thank you for what you've done and wish you all the best, Paul, in your overdue retirement. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Can I? I'm, I'm very pleased that Council Marcel. Brought, brought that forward. I just want to say you've been an inspiration to this island. You're a bit like mother hen looking after 
after the, the, the chicks and the flocks of the island and making sure that everything is scrutinised properly and giving great, lots of great uh, guidance, not just to me, but to my you know, predecessors and predecessors and predecessors. And I think it's really important that we have people like yourself and, of course, your new, um, uh, the person who's going to be taking over, to hold us to account and to ask the right questions. And uh, so, you know, thank you so very much. It's been uh, absolutely amazing. Well, th thank you, Chairman. It's, it's been teamwork, actually. We've got a marvellous chairman of House Group. He does a lot of work outside the committee. Uh, he, he can be a critical friend, but he can be a very supportive friend. He's a challenging chairman and he'll keep everyone on their toes. I've had a marvellous committee, past and present. Uh, House Watch have been an inspiration, helping sort of give some good direction. But you as House Partner and Adult Social Colleagues have been marvellous in coming to scrutiny being more than willing to accept criticism, but also more than willing to sort of seek out the best approach to delivering good health care for the island. And I thank you for that. And I want to sort of say welcome to Melanie. It's marvellous that she's been in post now for six months, been trying to suck everything out my brain, good, bad or ugly, and also the valuable support that Megan provides behind the scenes. It's all about teamwork and you're all part of the, the scrutiny family. So I'll thank you very much indeed.